Hi, my name is Ray Zalski, and it's my great pleasure to introduce our Warren Seminar speaker for today, my good friend and colleague, Dr. John Gulliver. John has been at the university for a long time. Uh, you might call him a lifer. He's been here for about 47 years in total, if you include his time as a master's and PhD student under the direction of uh, Heinz Stefan here at the university in uh, St. Anthony Falls in civil engineering. John has initially started his career doing a lot of work on gas transfer, uh, including in and around hydraulic structures, uh, spillways and dams. And uh, in the last 15, 16 years or so, John uh, started getting involved quite heavily in research related to stormwater treatment, management, and assessment. And uh, he's been quite active in that field and, and considered a major player, both state in the state of Minnesota as well as nationally. Uh, John's published quite a few papers in this area. I, I counted somewhere between 35 and 40 papers on stormwater issues. And uh, many of those are quite influential and quite highly cited, um, you know, on the order of 140 times or so. Um, and it's interesting to know if you look at his CV that eight of his top 10 most cited papers were all published since about 2010. Uh, and many of those were in the stormwater field. So I guess you could say he migrated to a field that's clearly very uh, hot. And, uh, and John's also been publishing some really influential work in that area. So he's probably made a really good move to, to get into stormwater. Uh, in the last uh, 15 years or so. Uh, he was also, uh, I also credit him with getting me involved in Stormwater. He was looking for some partners uh, to get involved in some of this work that he had coming up. And he thankfully asked me uh, to be a partner in some of that work. And we managed to publish about 10 papers together in this area. So, so thanks, I thank John for that as well. Um, John served the department in many capacities as of course a professor, but also a department chair. And he uh, was a, a leader for, for uh, about 10 years in our department. And uh, in addition, as I said, John's uh, contributions in stormwater uh, were quite influential, uh, not only in terms of you know, technology development, but also in you know, theory and, and practice of, of how to uh, both uh, treat stormwater as well as assess the performance of stormwater management devices. Uh, he's patented several technologies, including SAFL Baffle, uh, and a modified filled done permeameter and so on that he'll talk about uh, today and iron and hand sand filters and other technology that's that's been used quite a bit in the state. So he's had an influence both uh, you know on the theory and science side as in terms of journal publications as well as the application side, which is really commendable. Uh, he's actually made a difference in terms of improving stormwater uh, and the quality of stormwater runoff in the state of Minnesota and around the country. So. Uh, John's been a real credit to this profession and, and including a very influential player in the field of stormwater treatment and management. So without further ado, I give you my good friend and colleague, John Gulliver. Thank you, Ray. <clears throat> that was a very nice introduction, uh, probably too long. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, gizmos for stormwater treatment. All right, let me see. Now I had some questions about spelling in the word gizmos. So I thought I'd look this up. And Wikipedia says that gizmo is an alternative form of G-I-Z-M-O. A nonsensical placeholder name for something, a, generally a device that one does not know the proper term for. <clears throat> something like gadget, whatchamacallit, or thingamajig. So I guess this seminar could be called thingamajigs for stormwater treatment. So the outline, first thing I'm gonna talk about some background on urban runoff, why treat stormwater? Uh, it's just comes from the rain. Why not treat stormwater like drinking water? It's very similar in terms of its chemical makeup to drinking water. And, and finally, <clears throat> what are the source of stormwater pollutants? Then since this is kind of a swan song for my responsibilities in the department, I'm gonna keep doing research, but my responsibilities in the department are finished as of May 30th. I thought I'd go over some things that I'm very proud of, and that would be examples of stormwater needs solved by research that'd be technology that we have developed for the stormwater field. And then I'll finish with some take home messages. So why tree stormwater? Well, it's a major source of pollution to streams and lakes. Um, we have done a good job 
of treating our wastewater, but stormwater has really not been treated that much. And it's, a not, it's called the non-point source of pollution. Uh, updates to the Clean Water Act, uh, Act have emphasized treating stormwater uh, to improve the water quality of our lakes, streams, estuaries, and rivers. So the strategy in treating stormwater <clears throat> depends upon the, uh, the receiving water body, especially what your stormwater is doing, what the stormwater is doing to the receiving water body. And in combined sewer overflow, you're interested in pathogens. You do not want pathogens. You want volume control. You don't want to have combined sewer overflow. So you want to have infiltration and large storage. Um, chambers. So this is a picture of combined sewer overflow. Yes, that is combined sanitary and storm water <coughs> sewage. Not fun. We don't really have that much in Minnesota because we separated our storm uh, sewers from our sanitary sewers in the 1960s and 1970s. <coughs> If you're interested in the water quality of lakes, reservoirs, and streams, then you want to have phosphorus control. The reason is that phosphorus is the primary uh, <coughs> source of eutrophication and harmful algal blooms. Phosphorus is the limiting nutrient. That means that uh, the algae have plenty of everything else. If they get phosphorus, especially in the form of phosphate, boom, you have a bloom. So you have this cyanobacteria here, kills your fish, can make your dog sick, even kill them, and gives you kind of an ugly water body. If you have trout streams, then you're interested in temperature reduction and suspended solids control. Temperature reduction so the trout can live, they like cold water, and suspended solids control so that they can reproduce um, because they require gravel um, and uh, coarse sand uh, to lay their eggs. And finally, there's a double jeopardy if you have to worry about the quality of estuaries. Because in the upper estuaries, you have, need phosphorus control to stop eutrophication, the greening of the water body. In the lower estuaries, you have to have nitrogen control to uh, not have such a large dead zone. There is a dead zone below almost every river that empties into the oceans in the world, not just the Gulf of Mexico. It's just the largest in the Gulf of Mexico. So that's why I treat storm water. Now, why not treat storm water like drinking water? Because it's very similar. Its characteristics are very similar. Drinking water research has been around for roughly 170 years. That's a long time. It takes a while to get it going, to get the research going. Now, in 1855, John Snow, he was a, um, a, a doctor, an inventor, and our first epidemiologist for a modern society. He proved that cholera was a waterborne disease. Even though he didn't know what caused cholera, he proved that it was a waterborne disease. He uh, founded the Royal Institute of Epidemiolo Epidemiology, um, and it's been going great since that time. Louis Pasteur in the 1880s demonstrated the connection between bacteria and disease. Um, and especially between cholera and disease. So that's roughly 170 years of water treatment. So why not treat stormwater like drinking water? Well, there are two main reasons. The first is inconsistency of flow. Uh, this is a, a picture given to me uh, by Robert Dexter. When he was down in Austin, he saw a huge flood, took a picture of it for me. That was very nice. I, I appreciated it. Uh, 12 hours later, this flood was gone. There was no flood 12 hours later. So the inconsistency of flow is tremendous in stormwater runoff, especially when it comes down, hits an impervious surface. Impervious surface causes almost immediate runoff. It runs off and boom, it's gone. So you have three days between storms, five days between storms, two weeks between storms that, you that you're sitting there doing nothing. So that's a problem. It's not a problem that's encountered in water treatment. It is a problem for stormwater treatment. The other factor is that 
stormwater treatment facilities like rain gardens, infiltration basins, swales are out there. They're in the environment. So maintenance is a huge problem because you, you're lucky if you only have a person show up once per year to look at it. You don't have maintenance personnel around 24 hours a day. So for maintenance, you have to follow the KISS rule. That's what I, that's what I tend to do. And that would be, that stands for, that's the acronym for keep it simple, stupid. And I'm usually the stupid one. I'm not keeping it simple. You have to keep it simple. So we have a bio garden, uh, a rain garden on the left, an infiltration basin on the right, swales are next to all of our roads. They're all over the place. That's another reason not to treat stormwater like drinking water. This is why you need uh, stormwater research that se is separate from drinking water research. So <clears throat> I'd like to continue with some of the sources of stormwater pollutants. Where does this pollution come from? It's, it's basically rain that falls on the ground and falls on an impervious surface like this parking lot. I like this picture because it's got an old Ford Pinto here in the foreground. You can see the Ford Pinto, uh, the most dangerous car next to the, probably next to the Corvair. I love the Corvair. Uh, we, my family had two Corvairs. We uh, uh, destroyed both of them with front end collisions because they wouldn't stop. Well, the Pinto is actually worse. It blew up if you got hit by somebody from behind. So there's a Pinto here in the front, but you can see the stormwater pollution running down here. That runs off of the impervious surface. So you have things on your surfaces. Storm, the rain falls on the surface, carries what it runs into on the surface out into the stormwater sewers. So the source of pollutants, well, vehicle use is primarily the source of metals. Every time you, you hit your brakes, you leave a little bit of copper on the road. When you drive with your tires, you're leaving zinc on the road because tires have quite a bit of zinc in them and so on and so forth. Buildings provide metals as well. You have older peeling paint that can provide lead. We still have a lot of lead in our environment because it's a legacy pollutant left over from the leaded gasoline. But galvanized metal surfaces provide zinc and flashing and decorative siding provide copper. But a major source of pollutants because we're primarily interested in nutrients is landscaping, fertilizers, animal wastes, and especially leaves tree flowers, yard waste, grass clippings. They all go down to the storm sewer. They cook down in the storm sewer. They release nutrients uh, and they provide uh, nutrients for the receiving water body, which is not what we want to do. So I'd like to talk about three things that I worked on with my co-PIs and with my graduate students. Um, these are it's fairly small devices, not a huge change, but they, they're, they're working at it. I like to work at things. Uh, and so these are uh, items that make a little contribution in their small way. Um, the first is infiltration measurement. We have many infiltration practices, practices that infiltrate water. That's a good thing. If you can infiltrate, you should infiltrate. Uh, the problem is that's the spatial variation of infiltration rate or the saturated hydraulic conductivity, KSAT, is tremendous. Two orders of magnitude, three orders of magnitude, five orders of magnitude. That's five orders of magnitude is a factor of 100,000, I think. Yeah, it's, that's 100,000. Five orders of magnitude difference, and these are like two feet apart. The reason is because of compaction of the soil and also the plants opening up the soil because the roots need water. So the plants open up the soil so the roots can get their water. So you have a plant, you have a high infiltration rate, you have compaction, you have very low infiltration rate, up to five orders of magnitude difference. And so how, what good is your one infiltration measurement going to do when you have an infiltration practice? One infiltration measurement and you have five orders of magnitude difference. Well your one infiltration measurement is not worth that much, actually. You need many measurements of infiltration rate. And you can use statistics then at that point to determine the performance of your infiltration practice. 
So the current technique is primarily the double ring infiltrometer. The problem is that that's for steady state measurements. You have to measure over steady state and it requires too much water and too much time. You cannot take a bunch of double ring infiltrometer measurements. You can take one or two, but not a bunch. So we developed a modified Philip Dunn infiltrometer. It's based upon a Philip Dunn permeameter developed by Dunn and uh, popularized by Philip. Uh, and Philip did some of the um, some of the theory, developed some of the theory for it. We uh, changed the theory to turn it into an infiltrometer. It's a falling head infiltrometer. It measures head versus time. What we use is a 3D green amp assumptions to determine saturated hydraulic conductivity. Um, you take some math, change uh, some uh, geometry, some trigonometry, uh, some calculus. By the time you're done, you have a saturated hydraulic conductivity. It requires less time and less water than a steady state measurement. And it turns out it is probably the most accurate measurement device on the market. Probably because it determines, it determines things as three-dimensional. Uh, water doesn't go through soil vertically. It's primarily the capillarity of the soil that draws the water. So the water comes out as a bowl in three dimensions. And the one dimensional assumption just does not work very well. So here's how we measure KSAT. We have on the left, we have 20 measurements going on simultaneously with three people. On the right, we have approximately 15 measurements going on simultaneously, once again, with three people. The left is a swale. On the right is a rain garden. The MPD infiltrometer has been licensed to Upstream Technologies, and uh, they're in the process currently of marketing it. Um, there are about 300 sold so far. And we took our results, we measured up to 84 measurements at one location. That was, that took us a day. Actually, we measured 104 measurements of saturated hydraulic conductivity with a crew of five in a day and a half. So you can take a lot of infiltration measurements with the MPD infiltrometer. What we found is that um, on the left hand, on the Y axis, we have normalized confidence interval and that would be relative to the mean. The mean is this green line here. On the x-axis, we have the number of infiltration measurements. <clears throat> and we measured up to 84 infiltration measurements. And what we found is that at 20 measurements, you can only be assured with a 95% confidence interval that you are within a factor of two. <clears throat> so our 95% confidence interval is between two and 0.5. If you have only, if you have 10 measurements, you can only be sure that you're within a factor of three. So that means you need a lot of measurements and it doesn't matter whether it's a long swale or a small rain garden. <clears throat> you need at least 10 measurements to get within a factor of three, 20 measurements to get within a factor of two. That's, that's what we found. I was surprised by that level of uncertainty, but that's what we found. And that generally has been true throughout the last uh, 15 years. So that's the modified Philip Dunn infiltrometer. Now I'd like to move on to another device and I'll give you some background first off. Uh, we have the, we push a treatment train to reduce maintenance in stormwater. It's similar to, waste, to um, water treatment in that you have a, uh, an inlet, this in this case, uh, goes to a sump, which captures your heavy solids and your trash, and then goes to your primary treatment facility, which is a pond or an infiltration basin or a swale, typically a pond or an infiltration basin. And the reason you do this is so that you don't have to get in and dredge out that pond or clean out that filter um, more uh, so frequently. If you capture the heavy sediment and the trash here in your sump, you can capture half of your material. So you only have to go clean, it, clean out your pond or clean out your filter half as often. Um, so the problem is with these sumps 
is that when you have a huge storm, the water will flow into the storm, go into the sump, circulate around the bottom, and recirculate, resuspend all the material that you've captured, and then it comes out into your receiving uh, pond or filter. <clears throat> and that's a problem. It, it means that your sump has been used, has not served any purpose for settling solids. Here's an example. Large storm washout of sumps. I can tell you that this is where you have all your sumps being washed out of sediments in a large storm, and you get this kind of discharge. So the need is retention of solids and sumps, and, it's, and there are already devices out there to do this. On the left, we have a downstream defender. You can see the device here. On the right, we have a storm scepter. <clears throat> now, these, uh, what, what these do is the water goes through them and circulates around in this one, uh, settles down here on this plate, um, falls down the plate down into the bottom. This is where it's stored. Uh, something similar happens here. Water goes through here, down under, round, and drops out the sediments. The problem is the way that you clean these. How do you clean these? Well, you show up with a vector truck at the top. You put a big hose, about a 12-inch diameter hose down, and you clean out the sediments. But how do you clean out the sediments out of this one? That, that's actually fairly difficult to get down there. It's difficult to clean. This one is also difficult to clean. So we thought about it. We used the KISS rule and we came up with the Saffle Baffle. What is a Saffle Baffle? It's just a plate with porous um, holes put into it. With holes put into it, it's a porous plate. So the Saffle Baffle, the idea is that the Saffle Baffle takes the jet coming in from the, in from the inflow. It has a little bit of head loss across it because of the uh, holes in the, in the plate has a little bit of head loss, about an inch of a head loss, and that's all that's required to send everything in one direction through the plate. So you have one jet coming in with a recirculation zone, going down with a recirculation zone, you've turned it into a straight flow going straight across your sump and out your outlet, and nothing bothers the sediments underneath. Here's an example of what it looks like in reality. We have four panels because we're putting them down a manhole, and this is the installation here on the bottom right. It's been licensed to upstream technologies. There are over 1,600 installed. So I'm gonna show you an example of how it works. Um, <clears throat> what we're going to see on the left is that well, I'll have two, uh, two videos here. On the left will be a video of um, a sump without a saffle baffle. On the right will be the saffle baffle. You're looking at the saffle baffle here. You have flow coming in from the left, goes in across the saffle baffle, flows across the saffle baffle and flows out. On the left we will have flow without a saffle baffle and you'll see the difference. The sediment is uh, actually a white sediment. Let me see if I can get this going. Okay. So on the left, look, take a look at the left. You have a lot of white sediment kind of being resuspended. On the right is where the Saffa Baffle is. There's nothing happening at the bottom because the flow is going right across the top. So what happens on the left is that you have scour on the bottom. You can see the scour uh, uh, as the, as the uh, sediment shifts from the right to the left. And then you have sediment getting, kind of being pulled up into the uh, flow and going out the uh, outlet. On the right, you have a saffle baffle with nothing happening, even though you have more, more uh, flow rate, a higher flow rate. So that's how the saffle baffle works. Um, followed the KISS rule, developed a fairly simple device it beats all their devices by a factor of four in terms of cost, and it's easier to clean. So the next need, this is a pretty big need, and this is phosphate retention. Um, we need to retain the phosphate in runoff because 45% of the phosphorus in runoff is dissolved. And that's a problem because you can't settle anything, something that's dissolved. You can't filter something that's dissolved. 
90% of dissolved phosphorus is phosphate. And this is in runoff. So to retain a high percentage of phosphorus, we need to treat for phosphate, which is roughly 40% of the total. The rationale is that most urban watersheds need 80 plus percent capture of solids and phosphorus, including phosphate. And we are primarily treating for about half of the phosphorus without treating for the phosphate. However, precipitation, adsorption, and ion exchange are three water treatment principles, three unit processes that not, had not been used extensively. So there's a sand filter. Um, it's a... Uh, Excellent at removing particulates. The particulate capture is greater than 80%, but the dissolved capture is less than 2% because there's nothing to capture the dissolved particles. It's just sand, nothing to capture dissolved chemicals. So we thought, well, we would enhance the sand. And that's through the addition of elements that absorb or, precip or precipitate phosphorus. We tried some different um, uh, media calcareous sand, limestone, aluminum oxide, steel wool, iron filings, and the steel pro industry byproducts. The steel industry byproducts did not work that well because they changed the quality of the water. There was other things in there, and that's always a problem. And the iron filings and the steel wool worked well. Calcareous sand and limestone both formed a precipitate, and that's not something you want in a filter. The precipitate will clog the filter. And so we went with the steel wool or iron filings they are basically uh, elemental iron <clears throat> and tried them in, in an iron enhanced sand filter. Here's the batch studies. And we developed an experimental setup, um, three columns of 5% iron, two columns of 2% iron, a 95 uh, or 98% sand, and one column of 0.3% iron or actually three columns of 0.3% iron. That's so that we would have breakthrough uh, because we wanted to have breakthrough. And then one control with 100% sand. We had a reservoir mixed with phosphate at the top, uh, our synthetic stormwater at the top. And then we developed a mass balance model based upon <coughs> adsorption theory. So here are our experimental results. On the left-hand column is a fraction of phosphorus retained on the uh, y-axis. On the x-axis is the depth treated in terms of meters. <clears throat> and the 0.3% sand did have breakthrough pretty quickly. That's the green. The red is the 2% iron, uh, and it, uh, it did pretty well. Uh, and the blue is a 5% iron. 5% did great, 100% um, uh, reten retention, roughly. Uh, until you got up to about 150 meters of water and then it started to drop off. And here's our model. Our model pretty much follows uh, the data here. Of course, it, there was one fit coefficient to our model, so that's why. And here's what one looks like. This is a cross section. You have water come flowing in from your runoff, fills up the basin, runs through the iron enhanced sand, which is here, down into uh, your drain tile. The drain tile takes it out into this, this chamber and then out into back into the storm sewer. And, and you would use this where you cannot infiltrate water. If it, sometimes you need to treat the water and you cannot infiltrate it, then you really need a, uh, something like an iron enhanced sand filter, a filter or something like this. So Bar Engineering came to us and asked us about this, and Brian Hauser from Bar Engineering, and they and and decided to build and they decided to build one, and they still have the most beautiful iron enhanced sand filter. So that's why I still show this. The, um, you can see it's got this Stonehenge effect for aesthetics. Uh, it's got the iron enhanced sand here in the middle, uh, covered with pea gravel to keep the iron, in, the sand from blowing away with the wind. It's a basin which would fill up with water to here and then drain down through the iron enhanced sand filter and then out to a storm, storm sewer. Um, <clears throat> we have field results uh, and the field results were we re removed or retained the phosphate to below detection limits. So we don't really know uh, its percent uh, except that it's below detection limits. We don't know its percent removal. 
Uh, biofiltration facilities are interesting. I'd like to talk about them briefly. Um, they look nice. Uh, you have a, these, these are basically rain gardens. Uh, and they are great at removing hydrocarbons. Um, uh, petroleum hydrocarbons that run off the road, run, in, run into a rain garden, uh, and they can be removed by the bacteria uh, around the roots. Compost is also great at retaining dissolved metals. These, these rain gardens are composed primarily of compost and sand and a little bit of soil. It depends upon which state you're in, what, what the regulations are. And compost is great at retaining dissolved metals. It's just fantastic. We found that they'll, they'll retain dissolved metals for years and years and years before you have to replace them. But we also found that compost releases phosphate. Well, phosphate is the number one priority in Minnesota and in many states. It releases the phosphates. That's, that's not actually solving a problem. And, and people were slow to pick this up because they love uh, compost. Compost is a great thing. I mean, you take leaves, grass clippings, you put them into a big pile, <laughs> you uh, uh, let them heat up, they reach a certain temperature, uh, uh, they form the compost. Uh, it's, it's a fantastic thing and it's great for the plants, right? But if it's releasing phosphate, it's not achieving what you want. And, and the state of Minnesota, for example, has recently come around to this idea that compost is, does not solve all problems. So one concept that we had was an iron enhanced sand filter with bioretention. And that would be where you have compost amended sand at the surface. That's to, for the plants to grow, uh, to capture your metals, to capture your petroleum hydrocarbons. Underneath, you have iron enhanced sand, uh, and that's to capture the phosphate that comes in with the rain, with the storm water, and also that the compost removes, uh, uh, that the compost releases. Underneath that, you have gravel subbase and an underdrain uh, goes into a drain top. So this is what it looks like. Water comes in, fills up the, the basin, goes through the compost amended sand, had, releases uh, phosphate, goes through the iron enhanced sand, the phosphate is captured, goes into the gravel subbase, down into the under drain, and out. So we don't have many examples of those in the field. I, I've heard recently of a couple of examples there where they're, that are going in. We have a couple of prototypes that Pete Weiss built at Valparaiso University. Uh, they don't have that many plants in them because they are only there for one season, um, but they were a layered compost system and they had over 90% retention of phosphate and metals. So they, they actually do perform well. It's a little more expensive because you have to layer your soils. So some take home messages. First, storm water treatment is a fairly new field compared to others. It takes a while to get your research going and to bring things in. We need to adapt water treatment knowledge into storm water treatment and adapt it to the fact that the water comes all at once and then disappears, number one. Number two, you're only going to have some show up once a year to maintain it. So you cannot have something that's high maintenance. New technology is needed. We developed three <coughs> technologies, um, the MPD infiltrometer, the SAFL baffle, and the iron enhanced sand filter. We especially need to treat for dissolved stormwater pollutants because Approximately 45% of all pollutants, with the exception of lead, is dissolved. That'd be all the 45% uh, of the metals, a large portion of the hydrocarbons, and 45% of the phosphorus and nitrogen that is dissolved. So we need to treat for dissolved stormwater pollutants. That's going to require bringing more technology in from the water treatment field and adapting it to stormwater. Physical methods are not enough. That means settling or filtration. We need chemical and biological mechanisms to handle the dissolved fractions. Iron-enhanced sand filter will remove phosphorus. 
compost amended bioretention will remove metals and hydrocarbons. So we need something, things like this to treat our stormwater and have it come out clean. So that's, that's my talk. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for attending. I'm ready to answer any questions you may have. Hey, thank you so much, John. I'm taking over for Ray. Um, and if anyone has questions, you could submit them on the chat. We have a number of participants. So if you would raise your hand uh, and Sonia would, uh, uh, Sonia or uh, Mary. So uh, I see Ali, did you have your hand up? Okay. Okay, there's some questions coming in on the chat. Uh, John, where did you get your iron filings? Uh, iron what? filings were bought from uh, a company in Chicago. And the size, I'm sorry. I'm sorry? The size of the filings. Oh, the size of the filings, uh, roughly one millimeter in diameter. We uh, tried to make the size about the same as the size of the sand so that it wouldn't uh, rise up based upon the difference between sizes and wouldn't fall down to the bottom. So it would pretty much stay where it is. Uh, and that's, uh, we actually haven't tried other sizes, but that seemed to work. Okay, do you have any specifications for the different treatments described? Um, we do. Uh, uh, you have to, uh, I guess, contact us. Okay. We'll, we'll provide the specifications. Okay. Uh, can you reuse the phosphorus captured uh, in the filters? We haven't actually, uh, that's a good question. That's a question we get uh, quite a bit. We haven't actually tried to do that, mostly because uh, phosphorus, a phosphorus um, is a fairly inexpensive. And currently there's no real need, there's no real market for recaptured phosphorus where we can spend time uh, processing it and things like that because it comes from Florida and it's pretty uh, ubiquitous. That's not always going to be the case. And so eventually I think that we will be developing processes to recapture the phosphorus. It's possible to recapture the phosphorus. Uh, you need a solvent and it's pretty tightly bound to the iron. Are there any environmental issues with putting the iron enhanced sand in row in ROW? Yeah, um, not really. We haven't encountered environmental issues. Iron is fairly ubiquitous in the environment. Um, you have places with high iron, places with low iron. Um, yeah, we haven't really encountered any issues with iron uh, in the environment. Are pathogens in stormwater a major concern? Mm. Do, we, do we need to have methods to remove pathogens? Yes. <laughs> uh, they are a concern, uh, especially with closing the beaches. The beaches are all closed because of, of stormwater. So if you close a beach, it's primarily because of stormwater uh, runoff. Um, yeah, pathogens are a concern. We don't, I don't, my group, my, uh, my research group doesn't really work on pathogens. People are trying different things though. Another question on the iron filings. Where do you source the iron filings? Uh, they come from a company in Chicago. Um, Placestead can source iron filings for you. If you have a, um, a local company here, uh, Placestead is a very good company that supplies soils, uh, sand, and iron filings. Have you tried aluminum enhanced sand? Yeah, aluminum enhanced sand um, is, is really what you use with uh, uh, water treatment residuals. That's primarily aluminum based. Um, the aluminum that we tried in our batch studies didn't work too well. And I think it depends upon how the aluminum is treated uh, and exactly what it, what it what its organic, what, what its uh, oxygenation is. Um, so the aluminum we tried didn't work very well. That doesn't mean that aluminum does not work. It depends upon what type of aluminum you're talking about. Is the absorption capacity of the iron filings exhausted over time? Yes. 
Um, the iron filings rejuvenate because they tend to oxidize. That means they rust. It's the, it's the oxidized iron that captures the, the, the phosphate. And so that's why they, they tend to have a low level over a long period of time um, removal. But uh, initially they will, they will uh, uh, be worn out, they'll be used up uh, and uh, you have to replace them. Okay. It will take a, a certain amount of time, depends upon how much water you're putting through your filter. If you're putting a lot of water through your filter, if it's taking a huge watershed, it's gonna take less time to uh, use up your iron filings. If your watershed is uh, 10 to one basis, it will take 35 years. If it's an 800 to one basis, it will take five years. So between five and 35 years is roughly how long the iron filings will last. Depends upon what you're doing. 800 to one is a tremendous ratio of um, impervious area to your uh, size of your filter. But there are filters that are built with that ratio. Okay, I think you answered some of this. What would be entailed in retrofitting an existing sand filter with iron? Any noteworthy concerns and how often would the media need to be replaced or recharged with new iron filings? Uh, yeah, you could do that easily by uh, spreading the iron over the top and, and then using a rototiller to till it in. Um, you have to till it many times. Long, long beyond how what you think it's going to take. Not once. You can't go over it once with a rototiller. You can't go over it twice with a rototiller. rototiller. You have to go over it four times with a rototiller. Three to four times the rototiller over the entire filter, and it will be mixed in pretty well. You can mix it down to roughly the size of your rototiller. Does oxidation of the iron surfaces limit the lifetime of the iron enhanced sand filter? And if so, what's the estimate of the typical lifetime? That's asking a lot. <laughs> oxidation of the iron surfaces is what makes the iron available to capture. It's the oxidized iron that captures the uh, phosphate. So oxidation of the iron surface is good. Um, the length of time it's going to, uh, before it has to be rejuvenated, depends upon the amount of water you're putting through it, depends upon the size of your watershed in terms of uh, the size of your filter. Okay, how well would these infiltration-based stormwater mitigation techniques worst work in coastal environments, Florida, Texas, where the groundwater table is close to the surface? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, if the groundwater, uh, it depends upon how close it is. I mean, it's, uh, you have to keep it oxygenated. And so if the groundwater is right at the surface, it would not work because you're not gonna be able to keep your iron oxygenated. Uh, you have to have it oxygenated from both sides, from the top and the bottom. And so that's why we have drain tiles at the bottom um, that bring in air. And you also need a two foot drop across uh, a filter because you have to have one foot of media and another foot for inflow and outflow. If you don't have a two foot drop, um, it's, it's just gonna be difficult to get it together. You are muted, Joe. Sorry, sorry. A uh, question on the oxid oxidation. What happens if you don't have uh, oxygen? <laughs> Um, we aren't sure. Uh, well, uh, one thing that happens is you have anaerobic bacteria developing and it, it, it will uh, release, probably release phosphate if you don't have oxygen. Okay, drinking water is often treated with phosphates to reduce corrosion and drinking water supply pipes. Oftentimes runoff is generated from irrigation hydrant flushing. Is this a possible uh, significant source of phosphate? Yeah, I think it is. Um, I, I've been actually been trying to figure out how big that source is compared to other sources. Uh, and there are some problems in the whole 
uh, process of things. It's, it's kind of a, a lifetime assessment. Um, uh, but I think that especially flushing and um, watering lawns could be a big problem in terms of phosphate. Uh, and we need to, I think one solution may be to find another um, chemical besides phosphate to uh, stop corrosion of our pipes. Okay, um, we'll take one more. <laughs> Any issues with iron clumping? Um, and could you provide a recommended maximum uh, percent of iron? Uh, we recommend 12% uh, maximum iron, uh, more like well, actually, people have tended to use five to 8% iron. We recommend an absolute maximum of 12%. And the reason is because of clumping. The clumping will form, um, when iron kind of gets together, it, it will rust together and it will kind of form a clump. Now that clump is still permeable. So you still have water moving into that clump, um, but it makes, it, it's probably less permeable than the sand around it. And so the sand will have more flow through than the, than the clump. And so the clump probably reduces the effectiveness of the iron enhanced sand filter. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna cut off questions here. So thank you very much for all the questions, John. Great presentation, thank you.